Hello lovelies, in this video we are going to be going over everything you need for your AQA Chemistry Paper 2 Combined Science Higher for the 2022 exams. What I've done is I've taken my there's probably a big whole topic video and the workbook and sorted them out based on the advanced information. So everything that is a major focus is going to be at the beginning. Then we're going to be looking at the required practicals and then we're going to be looking at information that is not listed. Anything that the exam board has specifically said is not going to be in the exam is not covered in this video. If you're not doing that exam, then links down below for all of the other exams in this series. When we have particles moving around at a low temperature, they're moving slowly with not much energy. When two collide, they hit each other and have a reaction, but sometimes they're going to collide and there's not going to be a reaction. When particles move around with high temperature, at high speed with lots of energy, when things collide, you are going to get a lot of reactions taking place. Rate of reaction is going to be affected by temperature. Here I have put sugar cubes into hot water and cold water and you can see the sugar cubes in hot water dissolved much, much faster than the sugar cubes in cold water. For the rate of reaction, we can say that the higher the temperature, the faster the rate of reaction will be. This is because the particles have more energy so they can move around faster and this will lead to more frequent successful collisions. When we have a lump of something, it has less surface area, so there's less space to react. Here the blue dots, whatever that is, can only react with the pink dots on the outside. The purple dots in the inside are exactly the same thing, they're just not available to react. Whereas here, the pink dots are all spread out in a powder format, so they're all available to react. This is really confusing because the lump of whatever it is, is larger than the powder. But assuming we have exactly the same mass, the powder has more surface area than the lump, so more particles are available to react. Here I have two identically sized blobs of glue, and one I've spread out, and one I haven't spread out, I've just left it as a blob. And you see the one that's spread out, the one that has a large surface area, dries much, much faster than the blob I've just left in a big blob. I have a WhatsApp group of all my YouTube friends and they were super, super jealous when I told them I was making a video of glue drying. We can say that the larger the surface area, the faster the rate of reaction. This is because there are more particles available to react, leading to more successful collisions. If we have things at a high pressure or at a high concentration, there are more of them, which means they're much more likely to bump into each other and react. Whereas at a low concentration, they're not very likely to bump into each other and react. We can say that the higher the pressure or concentration, the faster the rate of reaction will be. This is because there are more particles in a fixed volume, so there is a high chance of a successful collision. When we have a catalyst, it's something that makes a reaction easier to happen. It lowers the activation energy. So for example, this catalyst fixes one of the reactants in place. So it's easy for the other reactant to find it. Whereas over this side, they're both randomly wandering around in the dark. And it's quite hard to find people when you're randomly wandering around in the dark. Whenever we have a reaction, there's an activation energy. Instead of just going straight from the reaction to the product, there's this hump. It has to get over and this bit here this difference is the activation energy however what a catalyst does is it lowers the activation energy so it's easier for the reaction to take place so the reaction is more likely to happen because there's less of a hump for it to get over this half arrow on top of the other half arrow going the opposite direction is a symbol for a reversible reaction ammonium chloride will decompose into ammonia and hydrogen chloride gas upon heating and this is an endothermic reaction because you need to put heat into it. Cooling it is an exothermic reaction because energy will come out. 
hydrated copper sulfate, which is a lovely blue colour. Upon heating, we'll lose the water, turn into anhydrous copper sulfate, which is a white colour. Adding water in, we'll turn it back to hydrated copper sulfate. Legitelier's principle tells us that whatever you do to a reversible reaction, the reaction will do the opposite. So in this reaction, this way is endothermic and this way is exothermic. So if you heat up a reaction, the endothermic reaction will increase to compensate and the exothermic reaction will decrease to compensate. Whereas if you decrease the temperature, then the endothermic reaction will decrease to compensate and the exothermic reaction will increase to compensate so that the overall temperature stays the same. If you're going to change the temperature or the concentration, the reaction will also adjust itself to compensate. If you are going to increase the pressure or the concentration, then the reaction will shift to the side that has less moles to compensate. If you're going to decrease, then it will shift to the side that has more moles to compensate. A couple of key definitions you need to know. A hydrocarbon is a compound that is made up of hydrogen and carbon only and nothing else. Crude oil is a mixture of different length hydrocarbons. Alkanes are hydrocarbons with single bonds only and the general formula for them is CnH2n+. Two. The first one with one carbon is methane, two carbons is ethane, three carbons is propane, and four carbons is butane. When we're drawing organic compounds, the important thing to remember is that hydrogen always makes one bond and one bond only, and carbon always makes four bonds and four bonds only. So you can see when I've drawn them, each of the hydrogens here only ever makes one bond, whereas the carbons each make one, two, three, four bonds. One, two, three, four bonds. One, two, three, four bonds. And because these are alkanes, they are only ever going to have single bonds. This line here represents a bond, and that is a pair of electrons. This is a covalent bond between these. You need to know the names and be able to recognise the pictures of these. And we can see the formula for these follows our general formula of CnH2n plus 2. So methane has one carbon and four hydrogens, ethane two carbons, six hydrogens, propane three carbons, eight hydrogens, and butane four carbons and ten hydrogens. To separate out the mixture of crude oil, we need to use fractional distillation. Crude oil goes in, gets heated up until it is a gas. It then goes into a condensing column. All of the really, really long chain hydrocarbons, which don't evaporate, come off here as a residue. And we can use that, the bitumen, we can use that for making roads. It is very, very hot at the bottom, and as we move up the condensing tower, the temperature goes down. And at each different point, different length hydrocarbons are going to come off. So we have gases at the top, petrol, naphtha, kerosene, which is fuel and for planes, diesel, and then fuel for boats. Short hydrocarbons are going to come off at the top, and long hydrocarbons are going to come off at the bottom. Things at the top are going to be really, really flammable. Things at the bottom aren't going to be really, really flammable. Things at the bottom are going to be really viscous, whereas things at the top aren't going to be viscous. The long hydrocarbons that come out of fraction distillation aren't always the most useful ones. We get large amounts of long ones which aren't very useful, but we don't get very many short ones which we need because they are useful. So we can crack the long ones using heat and a catalyst. And this is going to give us short alkanes, which we want, and alkenes. You need to know how to test for alkenes. This is also the test for double bonds or unsaturation. You can see alkenes have two E's in there. It means they have double bonds. For this test, we use bromine water, and it goes from orange to colourless. Colourless is really, really important here. Clear is not going to be enough to get you the marks. It has to be colourless. The complete combustion of a hydrocarbon involves lots of oxygen. That is your roaring blue flame on a Bunsen burner. This is going to be hydrocarbon plus oxygen turns into water and carbon dioxide. If you have a pure substance, it is going to melt at its melting point. If you have a mixture, it is going to melt over a range of melting points. We can test this by getting some crystals of the pure solution into a very, very thin tube. Putting it into a rather old-fashioned here melting point apparatus, you can see that the ends of the very, very thin tube have the crystals in, so we can see that happening. And then they go in the top of the melting point apparatus. 
And as the temperature rises, this is slowly heated up. We can have a look through the little glass window and see if the substance melts at one temperature or whether it melts slowly over a range of temperatures. The air we breathe is made up of lots of different gases, predominantly nitrogen gas with about 20-21% oxygen in there, and then lots of other gases, including a small amount of carbon dioxide. This is very different to the early atmosphere, which is mainly formed by things coming out of volcanoes. So we had a large amount of ammonia, methane, water vapour up in the air, carbon dioxide. This would have been a pretty unpleasant place to be. Ammonia smells like, well, it's a hair dye or like really, really old baby nappies. And methane smells like farts. So the early atmosphere, the early earth, would have smelled like farts and weak old baby nappies. The level of water vapour in the atmosphere decreased as it rained, which made the oceans. The levels of carbon dioxide decreased as the carbon dioxide dissolved the newly formed oceans. It turned into fossils and became locked up in rocks and photosynthesis started to take place. With the evolution of green plants, oxygen started to increase as the photosynthesis was taking place. The earth provides us with many things, including warmth from the sun, shelter from the trees, food from plants and animals, transport along rivers, and we can get all of these from the rivers, the seas, the atmosphere and the land. We would not survive very long without water, but only a small percent of the water on earth is suitable for us to drink, so we need to remove salt from it, which is desalination, and we need to make it safe to drink or portable water. To make water safe to drink we need to remove any dirt, mud in there, so any large solids. We need to remove the bacteria and we need to remove any nasty or unwanted bits of too many mineral ions like the salt that would be in seawater. We add in various different things to water. We add in chlorine to kill things and we add in fluoride for tooth protection and bone protection. There are lots of very important metals on earth and some of them are very, very rare. So we need to develop new ways to get rare metals out of low yield ores. Low yield is where using traditional mining methods wouldn't be financially viable. Two of these methods are bioleaching and phytomining. Bioleaching is when we have a large body of water, say a lake, which has metal in it, such as copper dissolved in it. If we want to get the copper out of the lake, out of the water, we can add in bacteria. These will take up the copper from the water and then they will leach out copper ions. It's basically the bacteria's way. Another method is if we have lots of copper again in the soil but at very very low yield. So not enough for us to dig up the soil and get the copper out say by reduction or electrolysis. We can put plants in. This is generally, believe it or not, broccoli. The plants will then absorb the copper ions from the soil. We can then cut them down and burn them and then from the ash we can do electrolysis. The disadvantage of using phytomining is that plants grow very slowly. rate of reaction we need to look carefully at the units used. For example here we have volume in centimetres cubed over time in minutes so here it would be centimetres cubed per minute and the second one we have time in seconds and mass in grams so this would be grams per second. In the first graph it is volume of carbon dioxide being produced so you can see that is going up and in the second graph, it is mass being lost. So you can see that is going down. If you want to find the rate at a particular point, say two minutes or five minutes, you need to draw a tangent, which is a straight line that touches the curve just at that point, not at any other point, just at the point you're interested in. Then you need to work out the gradient of that line. To work out the gradient, you need to draw a triangle bigger triangle the better and we need to work out the change in up divided by the change in across and your units you need to take from the graph. You can compare the rates of reaction at different points in a reaction. For example at the start of this reaction our line our tangent is very very steep whereas later on in the reaction at a different point our tangent is very very shallow. Different rates of reaction at different points. 
there are a range of different ways you can follow a reaction. For example, you can look at the loss of mass. This would be good if you are adding something solid like marble chips into a liquid and you knew that a gas was going to be produced. The gas will just go off here through the cotton wool and out and the mass will go down. It would also, um, for the same reaction, if you had a solid and you're adding it into liquid and a gas was being produced, you could collect the gas either in a measuring syringe or an inverted measuring syringe. We can follow the rate of reaction by looking at the colour change taking place in a reaction or how it changes from clear, colourless to opaque where we can't see it across underneath it anymore. This reaction is between sodium thiosulfate and hydrochloric acid and you need to be really really careful with this one. Careful that when you're doing this you're constantly washing things out so you're not contaminating things. Careful that you don't take it above 60 degrees because then nasty gases will start to come off at the end. Careful that you don't get it on your hands because it's going to start to irritate your hands. So with this one, health and safety is a really big concern. You can see as the reaction is going on, the cross, which was visible at the beginning, is becoming less and less visible. You need to make sure that the same person always measures the rate of reaction here. So differences in people's eyes don't mean that the differences in the type of time that the cross disappears could affect the results. One way that we can collect gas is by using an inverted measuring cylinder and putting a delivery tube through there. One of the things you need to be careful about is this gas in here that is already in the measuring cylinder before you start the experiment. That is one place that errors can be introduced. The gas is going to move from the conical flask through the delivery tube and into the measuring cylinder and it's going to be collected and we can measure it. Adding in large marble chips now, you can see that the bubbles are starting to collect in the measuring cylinder. In this, not only can you get errors because there's going to be gas in the measuring cylinder before you start, but there is also going to be some gas lost before you manage to get the bung on. Adding in powdered calcium carbonate now, you'll notice that the rate of reaction, the bubbles are produced much, much faster. The measuring cylinder fills up very, very quickly. We can use chromatography to separate out compounds and you're going to get, probably what you did in class, these beautiful, beautiful separations by a pen. We need to make sure that the end of the paper is just in the water and that you've drawn your start line in pencil. If you draw it in pen, then your start line is going to run as well and that is going to cause you problems. We're going to put a lid on here to stop the solvent evaporating. When we want to work out RF value, we do the distance moved by the spot divided by the distance moved by the solvent. There are three main greenhouse gases, with the biggest culprit being carbon dioxide and to a much smaller extent water vapour and methane. The bonds in carbon dioxide are really, really good at absorbing infrared or heat radiation, which traps it inside our atmosphere and warms the planet. Which means that when heat, light energy from the sun comes to us, it would be reflected back by the earth and normally this would go straight back out into space, but it's not. It's being trapped by the greenhouse gases, by the carbon dioxide, by the methane, which means it stays in our atmosphere heating it up. Global warming is a slightly confusing term because not everywhere is getting hotter. While we do have places where we're getting hotter, where deserts, countries, farmland is drying out completely, and the ice poles are getting hotter as well, which is really, really bad for the polar bears because they live on these blocks of ice. They hunt in the water, and when they need a break from swimming and hunting, they jump onto the blocks of ice and have a rest. The problem is if these blocks of ice are melting, there is nowhere for the polar bears to have a rest, so loads and loads of polar bears are drowning. And while the ice caps are melting, it means we are seeing increased levels of flooding in other places. As the sea levels go up, certain places, starting with places on the coast, are going to start to end up underwater. While Australia is having its hottest Christmases ever, us here in the UK are having our coldest Christmases ever, seeing unprecedented levels of snow. And the climate change doesn't just affect people, it affects animals and plants as well. As the temperature changes, the top of the mountain, which perhaps used to be under snow, is now available for habitation by new animals and plants. Now say if you had a little house here and you knew it was protected from certain types of animals because it was too cold or too warm for them there. With a the changing climate, animals are moving up and down slopes, their habitats are changing. 
as the temperature changes and as the location of their food source changes. We can see a gradual increase in the levels of carbon dioxide, which has taken up speed in recent years. And there are lots of things that humans do that have a massive amount of the levels of carbon dioxide in their atmosphere. Lots of human activities contribute to the production of carbon dioxide, burning fossil fuels for use as electricity, deforestation, cutting down trees so that the trees can't take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere anymore, and our reliance on petrol cars. The predictions for the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is that they are are just going to increase and global warming is going to increase as well unless we as a population decide to do something about it. Your carbon footprint is how much carbon your daily activities contribute to the atmosphere. This is going to be impacted by things such as whether you decide to drive or whether you walk to your location and whether you decide to eat food that's grown locally or food that's had to travel a long distance. One of the major pollutants is sulfur dioxide. When this goes up into the atmosphere, it dissolves in the clouds it is gonna come back down as acid rain. This is gonna have an effect on a wide range of things. It is gonna hurt the animals that come into contact with it if a lake or an ocean or a pond becomes too acidic. That's gonna to start to kill the fish and the plants in there. Plants are not going to appreciate having acid rain on them so they're going to die and it is also going to destroy limestone statues which are going to dissolve in the acid rain. Too much carbon in the air is going to lead to large levels of smog and global dimming. This is particularly prevalent in developing countries. When I was in Beijing it was really really hard to see out the window because it was so smoggy. Water vapour is going to contribute to the warming of the planet. Carbon monoxide is a toxic gas and nitrogen oxides are going to contribute to both smog and acid rain. When you're doing a life cycle assessment of an object, you need to look at the different stages of its life, the manufacture, the use and the disposal, and the environmental impacts of each of these sections. So the environmental impacts of the energy, so the energy needed for production of this, bearing in mind that this generally comes from fossil fuels which have been burnt, so electricity based on fossil fuels, leading to carbon dioxide being put into the atmosphere, the materials used, whether they can be used from natural resources or whether something else can be used, whether the natural resources have to be further processed, the production of the product, using the product and disposal of the product. Using the product, does it need electricity to use it? Does anything come out of it when it's being used? Production of the product, we're talking about things like atom economy, how much of the reactants are actually going to end up in the product? How much waste is there? How much waste of the natural resources that went into it when you're making the product? And disposal of the product. Can be it be recycled? Can it be incinerated for another use? Or is it just going to have to go to landfill? Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches. <laughs>